Hey, folks, before we get started with today's episode, I am here with my cousin, Dr. Erica Tani Harris, and Erica's lifelong friend, Dr. Naomi Udanin. And with everything that's going on in the world right now, we have some important, we're supporting a fundraiser right now. Uh, Naomi, why don't you start and tell us what is this fundraiser and what are we doing? Yeah, so I have uh, started raising money for two of my very close friends, uh, IDF reservists, who are trying to get basic equipment to their units before they deploy um, in the next week or so. So they are buying equipment that includes, you know, basic essentials like uh, warm sweaters, socks, underwear, hygiene products, and the like. Erica, you made some really profound points about who, who this is, who's going out, who's in harm's way. Can you share that with us? Sure, absolutely. So, I mean, this is our family. This, These are our children. I have two young children myself, and I think about them and think about what's happening right now. And I think that one of the most important values, one of the most important Jewish tenets is life, celebrating life, valuing life, and finding ways to protect the people that are in our community as well as other communities. Exactly. And we have this uh, longstanding joke that every Jewish holiday is they tried to kill us. We survived. Now let's eat. We're actually in the they tried to kill us mode. <laughs> you know. Yes, we are. And we're just trying to survive now. We want to move to the survival. <laughs> just trying to survive. Yes, that's right. So with that, please go to spot.fund slash equipment for IDF reserves. That's spot.fund slash equipment for IDF reserves. Thank you so much. This podcast is part of the Democracy Group. Welcome, welcome, welcome. We are talking politics and religion without killing each other. I am your host, as I hope you know by now, Corey Nathan, and I really am grateful to have this forum to have conversations with really interesting, accomplished people, people that... My, my, the qualification that I have at this point, are they of goodwill and do they come in good faith? You know, and, and I'm always just amazed at the, the folks who do have these incredible accomplished careers who have been willing to join us. And it's, it's just worth noting how grateful I am to be a part of these conversations and to uh, be continuing to learn so much from uh, wonderful, engaged citizens. It is also an honor to be a part of the Democracy Group, a network of podcasts that examines what's broken in our democracy and how we can work together to fix it. And remember, this is my favor. Uh, just leave a review. If you've left a review on one podcast app, go to another app and leave a review there. If you're part of journals that uh, review podcasts, go, go there and leave a review there. It really does help with our rankings and it helps get the word out so more people can participate in the conversations just like the one we're having today with Yuval Levin. Yuval Levin is the Director of Social, Cultural, and Constitutional Studies at the American Enterprise Institute, AEI. He is the founder and editor of National Affairs. He is also a senior editor at The New Atlantis, a contributing editor at National Review, and a contributing opinion writer at The New York Times. Dr. Levin served as a member of the White House domestic policy staff under President George W. Bush, and he has published essays and articles in numerous publications, including The Wall Street Journal, The Washington Post, The Atlantic, and Commentary, among others. He is the author of several books on political theory and public policy, most recently, A Time to Build, From Family and Community to Congress and the Campus, How Recommitting to Our Institutions Can Revive the American Dream. And word has it, there's a new book coming out next spring, so I'll be looking forward to that. Dr. Yuval Levin, it is a pleasure to be with you today. How are you doing? Thank you very much for having me. Doing all right. Oh, good, good. Uh, so I've been reading up on your biography, and um, I, I I need to start by asking: Do, do you still have family? I, I have cousins in Israel. Do you still have fam? You you were born in Haifa, I think. That's right. I was born uh, in the north of Israel, um, and yes, I've got a very large family there. Uh, thankfully, all accounted for. Um, but you know, very much, of course. Uh, Entwined and intertwined in in the terrible things happening there, so it's been a difficult week. Yeah, yeah, we're getting updates uh, daily uh, from my cousins there, and it's now my my direct cousins, uh, the, the the ones I'm closest to. It's now their kids. Uh, there's about mm -hmm. I forget of the eight uh, or nine. 
I think five are now active or maybe six. Uh, so we're just getting daily updates to see yeah. who's accounted for. Thank goodness so far everyone's accounted for. Uh, there is some extended family, uh, tragically, that are missing or, you know, feared worse. Uh, so I do want to Sorry. talk a little bit about that. Um, now, you, you wrote back in March uh, in the New York Times, the solution to Israel's governing crisis, therefore, cannot simply involve the triumph of one side or the other in today's disputes. The problem is the absence of a constitutional framework for Israeli political life, a shortage of mechanisms to balance majority rule and minority rights. Do you think that the instability there or the peak of of the dissent that, that has been occurring there in recent months and years, uh, do you think that has something to do with getting the eye off the ball? I, I'm, I don't know. Maybe I'm, I'm reaching here, but does that have anything to do with um, uh, the, the state that Israel was, uh, the, the culture was in um, that allowed for such a surprise attack like this? I don't know. I mean, I think that we're going to learn a lot about the intelligence failure that happened here. I, I suppose it's also reasonable to assume that the appearance of weakness or what can look like weakness to people outside of a democracy when a democratic society is at odds with itself um, could have invited the the aggression that uh, th that came upon Israel last weekend. Um, I, I think that if the um, if the people who thought that Israel was weak uh, acted for that reason, they're going to learn otherwise pretty quickly here. But it is possible that the the, the sense of division that has prevailed there now for the last couple of years um, both left them in a weaker place and and gave the impression of their being weak. I will tell you that disunity is gone. I mean, I, I, as, as, as you'll know, too, um, Israeli society now is very, very unified and resolved. And um, whatever comes after this will be a new phase in their politics, um, for good or bad. Um, they've seen the turning of a page here. And... Uh, some of the arguments they were having certainly seem now like they were quite petty, but I'm sure some of them will also seem like they're essential to resolve, and hopefully that's where they're headed when these dark days are behind them. Yeah, I, I, I had a conversation uh, with my cousins um, earlier this year, and uh, the elders, uh, my cousin Sheila and Alan, the parents who first made Aliyah in 1979, uh, I could tell they, they wouldn't really flesh it out in one conversation, but I could tell they were in, in sharp disagreement with um, their surviving children, Dina and Jonathan, about how they felt about Netanyahu. Um, but it does seem that that is uh, secondary or tertiary even uh, to what's happening now. And there needs to be mm -hmm. uh, unity. You know, that said, now here domestic here in the States, almost as soon as bombs were dropped and reports of of deaths. It seems that as soon as that happened, talking points in extreme wings were already emerging. So, for example, one um, that has been hurled numerous times is uh, about the um, how the Biden administration uh, essentially helped fund Hamas's attacks on Israel. Uh, number one, do you think is there any merit to that? Number two. Is it if so, it is now the time to discuss it? Uh, you know, I, I so I'm curious as to your thoughts on that. And I have a follow up question about um, some some uh, some barbs that have been uh, hurled from the uh, from uh, others. Yeah, look, I, I don't think that uh, the Biden administration's uh, attitude toward Iran played a central role here. Um, I, I didn't uh, I didn't like what they did. Um, I have very much liked what the president has had to say since the war began uh, just a few days ago here as we record. But, you know, there's always an inclination when something happens in the world to think, in what way is this the fault of the other party in our politics? And it's just what comes naturally to us. The first thing we can say is, well, those people are to blame. But, you know, a lot of what happens in the world isn't really our initiative and isn't the doing of one party or another in American politics. And we have to be able to step back and think, what is our national interest here? What should our priorities be? Uh, and not always begin from the premise that everything that happens uh, that that we don't like is the fault of uh, the party we don't like in our politics. It is very hard to overcome that instinct. We've seen it now over and over for 20 years that every major crisis that comes, the first thing we do is blame the people we're already inclined to blame for everything. 
Um, and, you know, it takes effort to resist that and to think concretely about what's in front of us in our politics. Some things are the fault of people I don't like in, in, in political life. Many things are not. And uh, it takes a mature attitude toward politics to, to think that way. You know, along those lines, I, I, as I get more ensconced in your work and I read others that – uh, some have associated with you and, and some you might um, em- embrace as your compatriots. Uh, I forget the term that was used as a form of conservatism. Uh-huh, but like the reform conservatives. Yeah. Reformatives or something like that. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, <laughs> Ross Douthat and, and some other right. uh, great thinkers. But do, do you do folks who think in a nuanced way and especially you have this quality that I really appreciate. And I think Yasha Monk did this in his most recent book where he gave proper credence to arguments that he is about to critique as opposed mm-hmm. to giving it a glancing blow and, and an unfair treatment. He really dives into um, in, in his book, The Identity Trap. He died as, as many good academic works do. Um, he 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 tries to assess it on its own terms and gives it a fair shake. So my question is, you, you do this too, and I think other good thinkers do this to argue with the best of the um, positions uh, of folks that you might have a disagreement with. Do do you have any chance in a climate and a culture where Fox News or or um, the conservative media or infotainment the complex? Is, is driving the headlines and even the degree to which my friends and neighbors and family members think. Do you have any chance in a climate like that? Well, look, I, I would say a few things. For me, the reason for that kind of attitude is a function of a little bit of experience in American political life. Um, I've worked for a president. I've worked for members of Congress, uh, a Speaker of the House. And one thing I've learned over that experience is that Everybody thinks they're doing the right thing just about all the time. Um, They're often wrong, and I think people that uh, come at politics from a very different direction than I do are often wrong about public policy questions. That's why I I come from the side I do. But they're not intentionally trying to do harm to the country, and that's obvious, or should be obvious. It's a simple point. But when you think about how we all approach politics, it's actually a pretty uncommon attitude to assume that nobody really gets out of bed in the morning to to hurt other people in our political life. Just about nobody. There are some real sociopaths, and we run into them now and then, but they are quite rare. And generally speaking, when you hear somebody say something you strongly disagree with, you have to ask yourself, why do they think that's the right thing? Because they do. They surely do. Um, it's important to ask that question in part because they could be right, um, but also because in order to answer them, in a way that's persuasive to people who don't start out where you do, but who start out unsure, or even where the other person does, you have to account for the reasons why this person is making the argument they're making. It's persuasive to them, and therefore it's probably persuasive to a lot of other people. So how? Why? How can you get at that? I think what it would take to win, if, if by win we mean, you know, can I, can I win the struggle for the, uh, the, the Republican primary voter – Probably not. The person who's much more angry at the left than I am is going to win that. But can you win in American politics ought to mean can you build a broad, durable coalition? I think both of our political parties have actually forgotten that that's what it means, that what they should be trying to do is get 60 percent of the vote, not 50 percent plus one. They should be trying to get 70 percent of the vote. They should be trying to get everybody's vote. And if that's how you approach things and your ambition is higher than just getting through the skirmish – then I do think that winning actually requires an approach to voters that says, maybe you don't start where I do, but here's why you should, or here's why you should end up where I do. I think that kind of attitude ultimately is the way to win. Um, and you know, I, I, th- I think that in a functional politics, it's what just about everybody who wants uh, to succeed would be trying to do. So ultimately, I do think that trying to inject this way of thinking into our political culture is very important not only for uh, ha- having more significant and substantive debates, but also for winning politically. Yeah, that's a, that's a, it's a theme and a great reminder. It's something the folks at A Braver Angels would exhort us to, to uh, or remind us to do, which is as opposed to find, you know, reflexively finding an arrow to pull out of our quiver, a rhetorical arrow to, to shoot at uh, our adversary, our supposed adversaries, perhaps that question 
uh, starting a question within ourselves of, uh, as you said, why do they think that's the right thing? You know, um, and, and to pose that question, if you're in a conversation, even a heated debate with someone, why, where does that come from? What in your experience, as Jonathan Rausch said when he came on the program, what in your experience has led you to this position? But before we move on, I wanted to tell you about something else that's important. Money, <laughs> uh, specifically your money. In all seriousness, I wanted to tell you about my advisor and my friend, George Meza. George runs Meza Wealth Management. And with George, it's not just about money. It's about helping us manage our present and plan for our future. And unlike a lot of other firms out there, George and I actually have a relationship. He knows me. He knows my family. And I know his wonderful family. I also know his firm and the incredible team he's put together from his chief investment officer to some of the other great people in his office, like Jessica, their head of operations that are always there to help me and with all aspects of our portfolio. You see, the thing is, I got a lot going on. I guess we all got a lot going on and I don't have the time to watch our investments all day, every day. And even if I did, I don't have the experience and expertise that George's team collectively has. So we get the entire Mesa Wealth Management team all their expertise and all their integrity. And again, it's based on George knowing me personally, knowing my goals, and even the kind of risk that's appropriate for me to take, which by the way, could change up from one season to the next. And they're on top of all of that. So if you want George Meza and Meza Wealth Management to be on your team, just visit their website, mezawealth.com. That's M-E-Z-A wealth.com, www.mezawealth.com. And that will also be in our show notes, so you can check that. And now, back to our show. Now, you, you also wrote a piece recently where you were advocating for uh, not open primaries, but ranked choice primaries. Right. So this addresses the very, um, the very, this very issue. I was hoping that you could describe the, the process of ranked choice um, specifically primaries, not in the generals, I, I think is what right. you said in the piece, yep. and why you think that would address some of these issues. Yeah, it actually gets at just what we were talking about, which is uh, right now a lot of the strongest incentives that confront American politicians are incentives for winning party primaries. Um, that's in part because a lot of seats in Congress are safe partisan seats, so whoever wins the primary basically wins the seat. But it's also because the general tenor of our culture, I mean, you find this even in competitive House seats, you find it even in the presidential race, everybody thinks in terms of how to win the primary. And party primaries, by the nature of their operation, by the fact that they are plurality elections, so whoever gets more, whoever gets the most votes wins uh, the nomination, means that you're you're fighting for the purists. Um, in, in a normal congressional race, about 10% of registered voters in, in a particular party will show up and vote in the primary. Those are the people who are most engaged in politics. They most want to hear you uh, take the fight to the other side. They most want to hear that you will never give an inch. And so that's what they're told, that you will never give an inch. The trouble is the, the work of Congress in particular is a work of negotiation and accommodation and bargaining. That's what the institution does. If you say in advance you're never going to deal with the other party, you're saying, I'm never going to do my job. Um, and that means that the incentives created by primaries are very much at odds with the needs of our national legislature. And we have to think about how to change those incentives. They're not set in stone. They're not even in the Constitution. They're In, in many states, they're not even in the law. They're party rules. And so the question is, how can primaries work in a way that would encourage the kind of person who could then be an effective legislator? I think the, the appeal of ranked choice, what ranked choice voting says is rather than vote for one person, this is my choice, you, you vote for your top choice and your second choice, if you want to, your third, your fourth. If, you're, if your top choice doesn't get, uh, it, it doesn't end up as one of the top two, then your second choice becomes your vote. And if, that's, if that person's not in the top two, your third choice. In other words, it matters who, you, who your preferences point to. And for the politicians involved, the incentive that creates is to be everybody's second choice as well as some people's first choice. The, the kind of person who is inclined to be capable of being everybody's second choice is likely to be a better legislator, is likely to be somebody who thinks about building broad coalitions, 
who thinks about reaching beyond his base, who thinks about appealing to a, a, a relatively broader swath of voters. And that's the kind of attitude that we're missing in our politics now. So I think we have to think in that way. I, I think of it as a very Madisonian way to think about politics. How do you structure institutions to create the right kind of culture? That's what that, that's the kind of thinking that you can find in the structure of the American constitutional system. And we don't do enough of it now. We take too many of the elements of that system for granted, elements that are not in the Constitution, that are not things we have to live with. We can change them. We can change election systems. We can change the budget process. We can change those things that are not working for us. And I think helping people see that that's an option, that it's possible to do that, is one way to to, to break the, the kind of um, – the kind of cultural failure that we find in our politics now, we feel like, what can we do? I mean, it, the, our culture is just absolutely teeming with people who have no interest in making it work. Well, we can change the rules so that that changes. Yeah, there are absurd incentive structures. Um, you know, getting more tweets is a bigger uh, or, or more follows or, you yeah. know, even small dollar donations. Uh, there There is some good to that. But um, it, it's uh, it, it can be perverse as opposed to actually sitting across a table from someone with a different letter before their name and trying to negotiate helpful legislation. So I, I do want to follow up on that a little bit. So specifically, rank choice versus um, yeah. open primaries. Why right. uh, do, do you advocate yeah, for both, so or do you- I don't? So I, I I start from a place that maybe is not the common place that political reform people start from. I think the parties are good for us. I think they're important. I think they're actually an essential piece of the puzzle of our constitutional system, even though they're not, they're not described and created in the Constitution itself. They do the same thing the Constitution does, which is they encourage coalition building. We have two large parties, which means each of them has an incentive to broaden its tent as much as possible and try to become a majority coalition. And that's helpful. That's healthy. That, that is a moderating influence on our political life. The trouble is there are now a lot of counter incentives pushing in the in the other direction um, that are kind of deforming the parties, and primaries are one of those. The, the 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 incentive in the primary is not to build a broad coalition, but to turn out the most intensely devoted voters you have. the The way forward, it seems to me, has got to be a way of strengthening the parties as institutions, not weakening them. We're in a partisan moment because our parties are weak, not because they're strong. Parties actually constrain partisanship, ironically. Because, again, they want to win a big, broad coalition. Uh, uh, The Democratic Party has to win elections in Oregon and in South Carolina. The Republican Party has to win elections both in Texas and in Massachusetts. That's an institution that has an incentive to to build a broad tent. And allowing that incentive to influence it more, allowing it to have more of an effect on how the parties work, is what we should be trying to do. Open primaries uh, would weaken the parties because they would say that it doesn't matter what party you're in. Mm. They're just these four people. They want the seat, and that's it. Nobody has – it's a completely personalized election. It's just what do you think of these four people? In a way, that kind of election is actually how we ended up with the two-party system. It's a long story, but the the presidential election of 1824 where there were four candidates and they were all Democrats um, is – and the election ended up in the House. It was a disaster. Uh, there were tremendous legitimacy problems. The House chose the person who came in second in both the Electoral College and the, and the popular vote, John Quincy Adams. Out of that came our two parties um, and out of a conviction that that kind of selection process has to happen before the election, not after, and that the purpose of the parties is to get us to a place where there are two candidates for president um, and they each represent a broad coalition. I think that is the right way for our system to function, and that's what we should be trying to uh, to encourage. So not only do I not think we should have open primaries, I don't think we should be using ranked choice in the general election either, because that also right. would tend to undermine the parties. I think using ranked choice in the primaries is a way to think institutionally, to think about how structure can shape culture that answers the kind of particular problem we have today. I I want to get back to U.S. politics in a second, but I, I do need to circle back on something – uh, some some issues about Israel. Um, there is I, I had mentioned earlier that there are extremes that are very loud. You know, even if it's just uh, on social media right now, and I, I, it just reminds me how I should uh, I should I should have about as much social media as cyanide in my <laughs> daily uh-huh. diet. Uh, but um, <laughs> but there it, it is it is beginning to seep into other 
statements. For example, uh, the Anti-Defamation League had to put out a statement addressing, uh, f- for lack of, I'm probably oversimplifying it, but there's like this colonialist, anti-colonialist framing um, that, that some, even um, Rashida Tlaib said, yeah. uh, you know, reasserted that Israel is an apartheid state. How would you respond to that kind of contextualization? Well, look, I, I think that the question of Israel obviously brings out extremes. Um, it also tends to bring out uh, various kinds of religious intolerance, frankly, and anti-Semitism. Um, it's hard to separate that from some of what has been said in the last few days. Um, and, you know, again, I, I think that um, it, it's, it's important to separate that larger set of questions from the immediate reality of the situation on the ground now, where we have to ask ourselves, why did this happen? Who brought it about? H- how does it need to be responded to? Uh, how can it be prevented in the future? None of that is helped by calling Israel an apartheid state, which it is not. None of it is helped by trying to radicalize people's sense of uh, what the conflict is about. There are, of course, uh, real concerns and interests of the Palestinians here as well. They have been terribly, terribly mistreated um, and uh, by Israel and by their own leaders and by the Arab states for three, four generations now. And, uh, you know, it, it is understandable that they are in a situation where they're extremely frustrated and looking for ways to break out of the situation they're in. That doesn't excuse anything like the kind of behavior that their leaders and that the militant wing of Hamas and others engage in. Um, and we have to be able to separate those things, that there is a real underlying issue here, but there are also just outright violations of the norm of human existence that cannot be tolerated and must not be tolerated. And again, I think it's a function of our immediate knee-jerk re- re- tendency to turn every question into a simple partisan debate that we immediately fall into this kind of uh, left-right divide. I think we've mostly avoided that around Israel so far. We're speaking just less than a week into the terrible war there. Um, I hope that can continue, but obviously there have been some examples of just that kind of uh, radicalizing of the question. Yeah, I've been mostly encouraged by our leadership and elected officials, even someone uh, like uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, um, albeit a measured response, she gave a measured uh, voice of support uh, for Israel. And I do think it's important to recognize and name that that impulse that many of our friends, family members, uh, folks that we interact with on a daily basis, we have this tendency to oversimplify, overgeneralize and vilify folks from the other side. You know, for, for example, uh, my own cousins would, would say that, listen, it's different. That Hamas is different than my Palestinian neighbor. You know, terrorist organizations yeah. is different. There, there was this story uh, that I heard that um, folks who lived within a football field or closer together, uh, one Jewish and one Palestinian uh, Muslim, um, they otherwise might have been considered enemies, but there was a problem literally with shit. <laughs> literally <laughs> with ha- what to do. to, to re- there, It was a new neighborhood, and they needed to figure out how to uh, build a better sewage system. And they ended up getting together and collaborating and becoming very good friends. And they said, who would have figured that we could figure out world peace through shit? <laughs> we could figure our shit, to, shit out together. So forgive, the, uh, forgive my French, my merde, but, uh, but that, that gives me hope that we can figure things out over the most basic needs that we have. Um, now, I do want to ask you, uh, I, I've been reading some, some great thinkers uh, and their analysis on this. Um, Brett Stevens asked a good question. What what maybe it's too soon to even ask this, but what is the best possible outcome? Can we even it, it, are, are we too in the muck right now um, to even start to consider what what good can possibly come of this? What might it look like? Yeah, look, I I think it is too early. Um, I think it's very hard to say what even w- what what Hamas might have hoped for in starting this. Um, there are very few imaginable outcomes that look good for them. Um, but I think everyone finds themselves now in a place that looks darker than it did uh, a week ago. And the question is whether ultimately this can uh, create a situation in which the forces that have tried to build some bridges in the Middle East are stronger rather than weaker, whether Israel's burgeoning relationship with the Gulf states can hold together through this um, and some of the kinds of um, 
of alliance building against Iran can be sustained through this. We'll see. Um, if if so, then maybe uh, maybe we do come out stronger. Uh, the United States and its allies there do, but uh, I do think it's too early to say that there are some dark days to come. So um, maybe you're somewhere in between uh, there and um, Anne Applebaum said this is a symptom of the deterioration of the rules-based world order. Are, you, you don't sound that pessimistic. Well, I think I'm not as pessimistic because I was never as impressed with the rules-based world order as Anne was. I, I don't think the post-Cold War moment really was a moment of uh, the emergence of a durable uh, kind of post-historical reality in the world. I think the world has always been a very hard place and um, moments of peace are sustained by acts of strength and that's been the case in the past generation no less than before. I think that if you were not illusioned by the post-Cold War moment, then you're probably less disillusioned now. Um, but this is a this is a dark moment. I mean, I, I do think that we've seen a kind of uh, Pax Americana coming apart. Um, you know, whether that means that what that moment was was really a broad-based commitment to global norms or international law, uh, I don't think so. But it was certainly more peaceful than the moment we seem to be entering, and so uh, I'm I'm going to miss it, whatever it was. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I want to take a step back for a second, more big picture. I, I've heard you say numerous times, numerous ways that politics and political theory are deeply connected. I was curious if you start with ideas that are more primary, um, such as a pursuit of philosoph or, uh, philosophical or even theological moorings, and then, and then derive political theory. Or do you start mm. more in the political realm and then derive political positions and policy from there? Yeah, it's a great question. It's a very, very hard question. Uh, my kind of academic training is really in political theory, and my experience since then has, has been around political practice. And I think the relationship between the two is very complicated. I, I would say that um, I think of political theory more as describing than as prescribing political practice. Um, I don't think theories create realities. Uh, I don't think John Locke invented the liberal order um, and and that, I, that's not quite the right way to think about it. But I do think that politics answers to an underlying anthropology, that how we understand the nature of the human person has a lot to do with how we think about political life, and that the division of our politics into left and right, which has endured now for a very long time, um, at least I would say since the age of the French Revolution, um, has a lot to do with a profound difference in Western broadly liberal societies about the nature of the human person, about whether we should think of the human being as, uh, in, a, in a Jewish and Christian sense, fallen, broken, um, born to sin, and therefore in need of formation, uh, which is how I tend to think of the human person, or whether we think of the human person um, in a more kind of uh, radically liberal way as born ready for freedom, but but prevented from being free by a variety of oppressive institutions. I think these two ways of looking at politics, thinking about it on the one hand in terms of oppressor versus oppressed, as the left tends to do, or on the other hand as order versus disorder, uh, civilization versus barbarism. I borrow these terms, by the way, from Arnold Kling, who wrote a wonderful book called The Three Languages of Politics that really everybody ought to read. Th those two ways of thinking describe, broadly speaking, the left and the right. You can see it in how we're talking about Israel, right? People who tend to think about the world in terms of oppressor and oppressed look at Israel and the Palestinians and say, well, one is strong and wealthy, the other is weak and poor. Obviously, we have to side with the weak and poor, with the oppressed. The other side looks at the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and sees civilization and barbarism, sees a democratic society fighting people who would behead children in their homes, and obviously we know where we stand. Those are actually two ways of thinking about how to approach politics altogether, and I think they actually explain an enormous amount uh, of the of the deepest debates and divides that we find in our politics. If you think about debates about policing, debates about immigration, one side sees oppressor and oppressed, the other side sees order and disorder, and they, and they're both right. I mean, they have something important to offer. The difference between them is not a matter of which is more right about the situation. It's a matter of what you actually think about human nature. And in that sense, political theory is essential to helping us understand political practice, even though 
practice isn't just applied theory. Yeah. So many questions now. Okay. Um, first, I, I have to ask, at what point, I, I'm, I'm imagining, you know, little Yuval in first or second grade, you know, raising his hand and saying, wait, so this whole Burkean conservatism thing, was he right or was Payne more right? Like, <laughs> you know, maybe I'm, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but at what point did you start to have questions and articulate and understand your own questions about the push and pull between what we now think of as right versus left, or maybe in a different framework, um, individual versus collective. What point did you start becoming curious about that stuff? You know, it, it's it's hard to know yourself that way. Certainly not in second grade, but I, I would say by by the end of high school, I cared about politics mm. and. I knew that. I, I knew that I was on the right, too, broadly speaking, though I can't probably quite recreate what I meant by that at the age of 16 or something. Um, and it was really over time um, and with the help of some teachers and some books um, that I, I came to think that there was something underlying our politics that could be understood in terms that were not simply partisan but that were about some deeper questions – um, and you know the the, the left right question has been my question uh, you know for for a long time it was the so you mentioned Edmund Burke and Thomas Paine they were the subject of my PhD dissertation at the University of Chicago which I later turned into a book um, I've been I've been wrestling with that question for quite a while but exactly when uh, just caring about politics becomes a kind of uh, political theory quest you know at some point in the college years I guess it, it's hard to pinpoint it. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny. Um, we might get back to the book, but it, uh, as I read through their arguments and their positions, I'm often wondering, wait, Burke sounds a little bit more like some people on the left now and Payne sounds a little mm -hmm. bit more, like, yeah. you know, and it's, it's constantly um, going back and forth. I was also curious, though, do you have other disciplines or interests that give you an illustration to help you better understand the the conversations and the principles uh, that is within your immediate discipline. Um, in other words, I, you know, I, I think about when I was working out some theological principles, um, the, uh, the people of Israel and in, in Hebrew Bible or the body of Christ, as they would think of it in new Testament, this mm -hmm. great teacher, J Cameron Carter gave me a great illustration through jazz, um, that, um, uh, what was it? Coltrane. Coltrane gave a great illustration um, that really helped me better understand the bo the concept of the body of Christ, which um, basically uh, is it, it's a theological um, understanding uh, the the tension between individual and collective and where we place ourselves within it. So mm. I was wondering if you have other disciplines or interests that help you better understand these big principles. Yeah, I mean, look, I I'm a uh, I'm a recovering political scientist, but <laughs> I I think that a, a lot of the kind of frameworks for my thinking um, actually come from a, a process of uh, of of trying to educate myself in sociology now for a while, real sociology, not uh, not the kind of partisan mess that too often now passes for it, but the kind of engagement with deep questions of the relationship between the individual and the collective that have been the essence of sociology, at least since Max Weber in the 19th century. Um, a lot of the ways that I think about political questions are um, a kind of uh, unsystematic sociology, self-taught sociology. And um, I, I, I think that where that often shows up is in a tendency to think about the way in which culture shapes character, mm. um, which is not a question that political science takes up, at least not since Aristotle. Um, but is very much, of course, at the center of how sociology thinks about the nature of the human person. Um, I've I've had a lot of help from great teachers on that front too. Um, you know, my my real teacher was Leon Cass at the University of Chicago, um, who thought about this whole range of questions from the religious and theological, really, to the question of the nature of the human person. Um, and I would say, in, in a way, what he taught me was how to paraphrase Aristotle, which is almost my only marketable skill. Um, there's, there's basically nothing I'm doing in my work that isn't just paraphrasing Aristotle. And if people knew Aristotle better, they'd, they, they'd, they'd have less to learn uh, from that work because that's all it is. And Aristotle really has a sense that the human person 
is shaped and formed uh, and is even that the soul is best understood as a form um, in ways that have that have very deeply informed uh, my own ways of thinking and of course his political thought and uh, ethical thought Aristotle's ethics at, at its core you know it says ethics is not about asking what should I do in this situation it's asking what kind of person do I want to be and what would that kind of person do in this situation mm. um, the, the difference is not a small difference, and I think it, it really it offers a kind of profound guide for um, how to contend with some of the deepest questions we all face. What kind of person would I want to be in this situation? That's a, it's a great compass sort of question. Yeah. It's a way to impose responsibility on yourself at the moments when it is hardest to bear. I... Uh, probably fall short of that uh oh i i certainly fall short uh, way way too often i did i did have a question for you that's sort of an on the ground question um you're you're someone who's been at the table so to speak at the highest levels where policy and legislation it's actually being worked out um so so the ways you have of exercising these political positions um and principles um are are more concrete than many of us uh so many of us it's worked out you know just in the conversations we are having, as I've mentioned, with our friends and our neighbors and and around the Thanksgiving table. So is it still important then for folks who won't be, uh, for example, a special assistant to a U.S. president on domestic policy to think about this stuff? Oh, I think it's very important. It's important because we're all citizens of a republic, which means we own this country. Um, this is our society and we're uh, we're going to share its fate in common, so it's really vital for us to understand the questions that it confronts and to be part where we can, at whatever level uh, it makes sense for us to be engaged um, in addressing those problems. And you know, we're also voters. We have to judge the people who make big decisions, and I do think it's very important for us to think through the, the problems we face. I don't think it's particularly important to win an argument with your uncle uh, <laughs> at the Thanksgiving table. It's just not. And you know, I think sometimes you have to be able to say, well, look, that's one guy, and I get it. It, it. it upsets me that he's saying these things. I really think he's wrong, but pass the gravy. <laughs> and at the same time, w- we have to be able to engage in those questions when they do matter, um, in moments where decisions are made, uh, in places where our voice can make a difference. And drawing that distinction, you know, I think in some ways the, the, the kind of technological space that we all live in now makes it very hard for us to tell the difference between these things. A lot of times the, the winning the argument in the moment just isn't really the point. And, you know, when you're engaged in a debate with somebody, the person you're debating very often isn't really your audience at all. It's, it's everybody else who's taking it in, who's trying to learn from it. And you have to speak to people who are open-minded and believe that there are a lot of people who are open-minded, even about whatever issue it is that you're debating with somebody who is not at all open-minded. And that that's hard work. Um, but, you know, I, I guess one lesson I've taken from having a little bit of experience in, 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 in how government works is that those debates do matter, that the, the shape that our arguments take, the assumptions we walk away with, are what we draw on in moments when there isn't time to start from scratch and think it through. And that kind of formation that happens over many, many years is what serves you when you have to make a quick decision in a moment of crisis or in a, in a moment of action. And so doing the work to make sure that goes well really does matter. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I just I, I want to put a pitch in for the title of your next book. I really think you're wrong, but pass the gravy. <laughs> um, but you, you're, you're right. I, I think when we do confront uh, ideas or positions that at, at first glance seem obnoxious to us. They stink. It, it, we have this reflexive reaction against it. When we take a second, sometimes it forces us to consider our own assumptions, our own positions, and to think through the merits or lack thereof of those positions. So I really appreciate that. And I pre- you did it especially. We, we've already referred to the, the Great Debate, uh, the book that, that was written from your dis- dissertation. I, I want to sort of contemporize that, if that's, if that's the right word. Um, toward the beginning of that book, you said Burke and Payne laid out the beginnings of the left and right. So ha- how might we better understand conservative philosophy or conservative dis- disposition if we're lo- looking more to a figure like Edmund Burke versus what passes for conservative, I, I don't even have to say MTG yeah. or even Jim Jordan, uh, who's right. vying for a very prominent role. 
Well, so I'd say a few things. I, I, I think Burke is enormously important to understanding conservatism, not for uh, a genealogical reason, not because conservatives in America have read Burke and so are shaped by him to, to say what they say, but because there are always these roughly two but broad and interspersed uh, ways of thinking about political life in a free society. And Burke spoke particularly clearly and in an especially articulate way for one of those views, and it is the views that begin. It is the view that begins from uh, a, a lower view of human nature, a sense that people are born uh, fallen and frail and in need of formation, and that the institutions that provide that formation are essential and vital and have to be protected and reinforced in every generation: the family, the church, the school, even the institutions of our culture and our politics. Conservatives in that tradition are therefore very protective of institutions, of tradition and of existing institutions. That's what makes them conservative. It's what they're conserving. Um, and the, the opposing view says that fundamentally it looks out at the same world, a world that is a mix of good and bad, and rather than be struck first by the good and seek to protect it and build on it to address the bad, it's struck first by the bad and seeks to uproot it, to, to eliminate the sources of injustice, an understandable disposition. We all feel it sometimes. Um, and I think that view, therefore, cares much less for institutions and for traditions, thinks that getting to the right place in politics is much simpler than that. Um, I think it would not be wrong to say that we have seen um, a, kind of, uh, a, a, a kind of radicalization of the American right over the last two generations that has made it less protective of institutions. It's more populist and less conservative now. Populism is not a conservative force, generally speaking. Um, and I think today's uh, American right, there are still a lot of conservatives in the Republican Party, but there are also a lot of populists in the party who are not first and foremost conservatives. They're not fundamentally protective of institutions. They're pretty hostile to institutions. Um, I think we've seen, you know, if there's a left-right axis in our politics, as I think there is, there's also an insider-outsider axis. Uh, who thinks they're in charge rightly of the institutions and who thinks they're on the outside banging on the window? I think the left and right have switched sides on the insider-outsider axis in my lifetime. So that today, the American right thinks of itself as on the outside, banging on the windows, uh, and the left thinks of itself as on the inside, uh, upholding the standards. And that's very different from the way things were, say, 40 years ago. Um, and so you find the right defending, for example, freedom of speech, which was very much a left-wing cause for most of the 20th century. Um, you find the right engaged in a particular kind of outsider conspiracism, um, where you know the the deep state and corporations are engaged in trying to put us down. That's how the left talked for most of my lifetime, and it's how the right talks now. And you've also seen that transformation on the left. The left thinks of itself as in possession of the institutions. So it, there's an authoritarian streak to the left now. There are are efforts to constrain free expression and free speech to assert authority. There's a kind of in, insider conspiracism on the left. They lose an election. They say Russia. Uh, stole the election. Well, that's something the right would have said in most of the 20th century. It's now how the left talks. I think we have to be alert to that transformation because it has a lot to do with the character of our politics now. It's connected to the conservative-progressive divide, but it's not the same. And I think that it describes a very, very important dividing line now that has a lot to do with the tenor of our politics and with the condition of our politics. Yeah, I... Uh one of the arguments I heard in 2016 for supporting Trump wasn't necessarily a conservative argument so much as we want somebody to go in there and blow it all up. Uh, right. But if I, I mean to say that's not necessarily conservative, that is the opposite of conservative. Right. Blow it all up is exactly what Edmund Burke was there to stop. Right. Right. And you seem to, you know, it's funny because I, I had this conversation with uh, Mike Madrid uh, the other day, who reminded me again and again, politics is downstream of culture. Um, and, and similarly, you're saying you're expressing a, a belief in the merits of our institutions, as you long have. You know, I think there's a there's a there's a sort of historical trajectory to this view um, that it, it's part of what I described in an earlier book uh, called The Fractured Republic, that a lot, a lot of what we have to understand about contemporary American life has to do with the centrality of the post-World War II decades in our self-understanding now. 
not only because a lot of our leaders w- were born in the 1940s, um, but also because th- the culture's sense of itself in a lot of important ways comes from that very unusual moment in American life after World War II, after the Depression, where Americans had extraordinary confidence in our institutions and our leaders. Very, very unusual confidence. There'd never been anything like it before, and there has not been since. And that moment um, had its own excesses. It, it didn't have some of the problems we have now, but it had different problems. If you look at American culture in that moment, it's a culture screaming for liberation, liberation from conformity, left and right. And that liberation came. That culture freed itself from uh, the conformity of a kind of strong mainstream. And it did it by attacking that confidence in institutions, by diminishing it some. I think that confidence was excessive, but we have now gone so far in the other direction that our first instinct is an intense cynicism about our institutions, our leaders, one another. Um, And we're in a place where we need to recover some sense of confidence in the capacity of American institutions and American elites. Uh, And we're finding it very, very difficult. We have something like the mirror image problem of that American culture of the 1950s and early 60s. Uh, We're screaming for solidarity, but it's very, very hard to produce solidarity. I think a lot of of the ugliness that you find on the left and the right nationalism or identity politics. These are just ways of trying to produce solidarity. And they're not working. They're not the right ways. I think the right ways are going to require a kind of return to the American political tradition. Um, But, you know, that's my conservative prescription. I'm sure that there are others. So forgive me if I sound like I'm oversimplifying, but I want to distill a couple of big concepts from two of your earlier works together to try to bring it together for a really pointed question. And and, and so (laughs) that said... <clears throat> in the fractured republic, I, I think it, it, is it fair to summarize that you labeled um, uh, baby boomer politics as nostalgic, while at the same time uh, progressive policies or proposals as anachronistic? So there is a similarity there, and then tying that together with something that you dealt with in in the um, the Burke and Payne book, the Great Debate, um, you, you you reintroduced us to Burke's um, Burke's virtue of equipoise. So I guess the, the pointed question would be, is, are, are the fights that we're having today, do they threaten the equipoise of our, our republic? Or is this just something that uh, the, the sort of chaotic nature of uh, mm-hmm. what it means to be American? Well, you know, th- th- there's certainly some of both in there, but I do worry about the, the, the kind of fights we're having today. And what worries me about them, it has to do with the way you put the question – what worries me about them is that they're not about the future. Um, they're, they're not about what kind of future do we want to have together. They're about whose fault is it mm. that there is no future for America. But there is. That, the, premise of the, question, the premise of the debates is wrong. The premise of the debates is we're about to fall off the cliff and it's your fault. No, it's your fault. <laughs> um, we're not about to fall off the cliff. We actually have to think about 2050 because you know what? For all that we have a lot of problems – we are the, the world's preeminent power. We are the wealthiest society in the world. We are a very free and dynamic country. There's nowhere you would rather be, if you think about it w- with any kind of objectivity, um, than the United States of America in the 21st century. We're going to be here in 2050 and 2060, and what are we going to need then that we don't have now? That's what our politics should be about. That's what a healthy politics would be about. 2050 is not that far away. Um, you know, it's about as far away as the 1990s. Um, so I, I think we, w- where we fail is that we fail to argue about the future. We're going to argue about it. If we were having a functional politics, it wouldn't be clean. It wouldn't be just people being nice to each other. We would be arguing, but we would be arguing about the needs of, of the future. And yeah. right now, what troubles me is that those aren't the debates we're having. I think that's what recovering uh, a healthier politics would look like. Wow. A healthy, what would a healthier politics look like? I think you have a lot of good proposals, uh, not just in the books, but a lot of the, the essays and the, the conversations that you're having, um, the, the, the panels that I've heard you on, the podcast that you've participated in. Um, but for the record, I am a husband and the dad of three young adult kids, and um, I am it is always my fault. <laughs> so whose fault is it? It's always <laughs> yeah, my fault. Yeah, me too. I've got two of them, and yes, yes, it is always my fault. So I, I want to um, 
I, I want to start to land this plane. I, I want to ask you the big, I call it the TPNR question. Uh, and, and we've been sort of addressing this throughout the conversation so far. But what do you think each of us can do to be able to share space with, have better conversations with, perhaps even nurture relationships with people across our differences, people who think differently than we do, who have different beliefs than we do, who get their news from different sources than we do. How can we do better at talking politics and religion without killing each other, or is it even possible? You know, I think a lot of what's necessary is recognizing that the the structures of our public life, our politics and a lot of our culture – are there for the purpose of letting us live together despite differences. Um, I think it's really crucial to see, and this is actually, it, it's a nice segue to end with because it's the subject of my next book. I think this points to an idea of unity that is distinct to the American way of politics. In a free society like ours, this is what I draw from James Madison. Unity does not mean thinking alike. Unity means acting together. And that difference naturally invites the question, how can we possibly act together when we don't think alike? Our constitution and our public life is an answer to that question. How can we act together when we don't think alike? The answer to that question is the American political tradition. The answer to that question is what we should be teaching when we teach civics. It's what we should be thinking about when we approach each other. Our goal is not to end up all thinking alike. That is an impossible goal. Our goal is to act together to address common problems, and we can do that. We can do that by acknowledging each other's interests and needs. We can do that by negotiating and bargaining, insisting on what we need most, but also seeing that the only way to get it is to recognize what other people need most. And we have a lot of structures and mechanisms and forms and habits that let us do that. The, the, we Americans are actually pretty good at uh, arriving at a problem and then creating a structure for figuring out together how to deal with it, even when we don't all agree. Tocqueville has this joke in, the, in a letter to his father in the 1830s where he says, you get three Americans together and they elect a treasurer. <laughs> um, there's actually something very profound about that. What they're doing is thinking about how to organize themselves around a problem. I think that's something that we have been good at over the years, but that we've become less good at. And in, in thinking about how to deal with our divisions – we have to think concretely about that kind of problem. How do we create a structure for resolving a problem we confront together without requiring us to all agree on everything because that's not possible? I think that's a, that kind of lowering of the sights, uh, an understanding of what unity is and isn't, is really necessary for us to move forward. That's profound if for no other reason than I never thought that Tocqueville could have worked the Borscht Belt. <laughs> 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 I never thought of it that way. Um, I, I am reminded, though, of uh, – I forget where I saw it, but you quoted uh, several of the founding fathers, a couple of whom would go on to become president uh, after the ratification of the Constitution and the humility that they saw that moment. They, you know, they all basically said, well, it ain't perfect, but it's what we got. Right. <laughs> you know? Let's hope it doesn't fall apart. Yeah. <laughs> right, right, right. So uh, do you have any questions – oh, I didn't – I'm sorry. I didn't warn you that I'd be asking this. Do you have any questions for me? You know, the, the thing I wonder is just what, above all, what would you say you've learned from talking to people uh, of the caliber you've been talking to um, about how Americans can live together? I mean, if you were to say, I've spent all this time, I've done all this thinking, the first lesson for me is, what would it be? What comes to mind is something that you reminded us, uh, you, you reminded me of earlier in the conversation, which is uh, what Monty Guzman would call a radical curiosity, as opposed we have to we have to train those reflexes that we've developed maybe in the age of social media to immediately come back with uh, the the perfect rhetorical comeback, um, and instead engage that other part of ourselves that other virtue of being genuinely curious about a human being. Um, you know, oh, why do you think that? What, why do you think that is? How did you arrive at that conclusion? What, tell me about your life. Tell me about, in, in your life experience, you know, she, she describes uh, in, in her book that came out about a year ago, how she brought a group of people from her neighborhood, uh, I think it's close to Seattle, Washington, about five hours away to the um, very northern part of Oregon, um, where it was 80% red or 80% Trump voters. And 
it, they had basically lunch together and they had they spent the day together just to learn about each other. And there was this moment when one of the folks from the um, Red County in uh, in Oregon held up the sandwich and said, you know what I'd love is if a lot of you folks from Seattle, I think it was Kings County in, in Washington, if a lot of you folks knew exactly how this piece of bread got on your table, what it takes for guys, he was a farmer, what it takes for guys like me um, to, to get it from my, my field uh, to your plate. So just understanding each other a little bit better um, and prioritizing the relational over the transactional. Uh, especially the transactional that, that tends to be um, heated um, and averse, anti-partisan, um, putting on our jerseys and fighting with each other according to whatever color we're wearing. Um, so it's it's been a it's been a an interesting journey so far. Man, there's a lot of work to do because there's some folks who are able to do it at high levels and and really change some of the foundations of the institutions. Um, and, and they they see the fruits of their labor um, and others. It is over the Thanksgiving table. So instead of passing the grave, we're throwing the mashed potatoes at each other before mm-hmm. the end of the night. Yeah. So um, is there anything I forgot to ask you? Anything important that that you wanted to add that um, that that I hadn't asked you yet? No, I don't think so. All right. Well, that actually, Monty Guzman told me I should ask that at the end of, uh, or no, 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 it was uh, Barb McQuaid who said that's a good one because then people will trap themselves. They'll make you know, <laughs> but uh, you certainly did not trap yourself or make yourself guilty. This was a really uh, fun conversation. I, I learned a lot, and I just have a lot more reading to do. Usually, I just I do a, a flurry of reading right up into the conversation, and then you know, uh, but I'm going to be. Uh, I do have. I read it earlier about a decade ago, but I I do want to finish it a second time because I have new insights and I'm reading it from a different perspective now that the great debate is fantastic and i'm looking forward to the next one uh before we close how can folks follow you and find more information about the great work you're doing and look for the book that's coming out next spring well thank you i I work at the american enterprise institute um and so you can go to ai.org and uh, look me up there and also see the work of a lot of my wonderful colleagues on a huge range of public policy issues excellent Yuval, I really appreciate you doing this. I really appreciate you taking the time. It's a real thrill for me be- because I, I've been um, you know, following your work for quite some time. So thanks again for coming in. It's, this has been great. Thank you. And as always, if you dig what we're doing here, please hit that subscribe button, leave a review and comments wherever you get your podcasts. And tell a friend about talking politics and religion without killing each other. We're super easy to recommend. Just go to politicsandreligion.us. It's www.politicsandreligion.us. Or you can find me online at Corey S. Nathan. That's Corey with an E and S is in Sam at Corey S. Nathan. Now go talk some politics and religion and maybe some Burke and pain with gentleness and respect and have a great week. 